This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Chapter 12 deals with theories of motivation. And motivation uh, is uh, really the, the desire uh, to achieve something or to avoid something, the urge, the push, if you like. Um, it can be described, I think described in your notes, uh, somebody once said motivation is getting people to run towards a target rather than just kind of walking kind of slowly towards a target. When we talk about a motivated person, uh, you, you, they, they are quite inspired, they're quite fired up, uh, really very keen. Uh, and it's important to managers to understand what gives rise to motivation uh, because a motivated worker is probably going to achieve more uh, and achieve better results than the unmotivated worker, the uninspired person. Managers need to know what, in a way, turns their workforce on, what makes them enthusiastic. Uh, because it's only through enthusiasm that you're going to get uh, more production and you're going to get better production. Uh, the motivated worker is not necessarily a comfortable uh, staff member to have. The truly motivated worker could be quite, uh, in a way, quite tricky uh, to work with because they're never going to be just satisfied, perhaps, uh, with how things are done. They, they will be striving for improvement. There are two uh, main uh, theories of um, uh, motivation. Uh, first one, first group of theories is content theory. Content theory is uh, almost really saying uh, what is it in somebody, you know, what's the content of somebody's job uh, that would motivate people? What do they need to get out of their job? Uh, basically, that, that's going to be motivating them. And the second uh, theory or group of theories is a process theory, uh, which is going to be looking more at the mental processes which give rise to motivation. So content theory and process theories. And the first uh, and very famous um, theory of motivation uh, is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, uh, invented in the early 1950s, uh, where Maslow said that um, what we need, what we want, and therefore what will motivate us, uh, goes up through a specific hierarchy. And it said, uh, basically, if you are destitute, if you have nothing, uh, then what uh, you are going to be motivated by is uh, methods which will allow you to, say, buy food, uh, to find somewhere to live, to buy clothing, uh, to buy heating, and so on. These are the so-called physiological needs at the bottom of the, the, uh, the, the hierarchy, at the bottom of the pyramid. So if you took somebody who was absolutely, as I say, destitute, uh, and you offer them very, very basic pay, uh, then they will do the job because they need that basic pay. It will motivate them. They will act in a certain way uh, because they need that basic pay to feed themselves, to clothe themselves, to find shelter, to find heating, and so on. He then said, once you have enough to eat, somewhere to live, and, and so on, the people will change uh, their attention to the next uh, item in the hierarchy, which is safety needs. Uh, safety needs, uh, so here it might be a kind of part-time casual job. Uh, and then what you would quite like is, is maybe the next thing will motivate you is a full-time job. Uh, so the safety, you know where you're going to be working next week, you know that you're going to be paid next week, and so on. And you might even be willing to, to, to take slightly less money here than you get here uh, because of safety. So now we have uh, safety needs uh, taken care of, our basic physiological needs, we feel fairly secure and kind of um, uh, not, not, not too anxious in our jobs and so on. Where do we turn our attention to next? Now it's going to be social needs. Uh, we have social needs, uh, we need friends, for example, we need uh, family and so on. Uh, 
uh, we need time to be able to, uh, to talk to people and enjoy ourselves in many ways. Um, so once you've got the, the kind of basic and the safety stuff, then we say, oh, gosh, what can I do in my free time? Then we have esteem needs, sometimes called ego needs. This is uh, needs uh, that, um, uh, in, in a way, uh, people look up to us. Uh, we feel that we are perhaps valued. Uh, we, people, we feel people recognize us uh, as maybe having done something good. And we all uh, feel with the name, the, the, the need of esteem. Uh, and then finally, uh, self-actualization. Uh, the needs that we maybe all have, but maybe few of us get, uh, that uh, we're actually achieving something which is worthwhile, uh, that we're maybe maximizing our potential. Uh, it's almost as though uh, that when you're lying on your deathbed, you can look back and say, yes, it's all been worthwhile because this is what I achieved. Now, Maslow recognized that you will not necessarily uh, get all of these needs met at work. These are, these are just general needs here. Uh, but insofar as you can get them at work, they will motivate you. Uh, so if you had somebody who was born very, 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 very rich, they wouldn't need any job at all. Uh, there's been no problem with uh, food and rent. They're obviously country secure. Uh, with lots and lots of time to, to be socializing and so on. Uh, people will probably look up to them because you're, you're very, very rich and you have maybe a, uh, a, you know, a, a very expensive looking car and a very nice looking house and people kind of uh, view you with some esteem there. And self-actualization, uh, maybe you think, well, I'm here, I'm rich, I'm, I'm going to enjoy life, this is, this is my aim in life and so on. Uh, most of us are not uh, born uh, it was uh, such good fortune. Uh, and so some of these, in, by and large, you get through work, some of them you get at home. Uh, so, for example, if you were working in a very basic kind of manual job, in a factory, let's say, with a lot of noise going on, it, it could be quite difficult uh, for you to meet many of your social needs through work. Uh, because the noise, you're wearing ear defenders and so on, the noise will mean that you, you can't really socialize very much at work and, and so on. Uh, so what you would be doing here, using uh, some of the money which you maybe get down here, uh, uh, to maybe join clubs or to, to go to football matches or to uh, uh, go away on holidays and so on. You, 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 you're meeting the social needs outside work. Uh, again, if you don't get promotion at work, if you stay fairly, fairly close to the bottom, uh, you, you're not going to be getting very much esteem or ego needs met at work. Uh, and maybe where people look up to you, it, it's at home. Maybe your children look up to you as a father or mother and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, probably not that many uh, jobs or professions where you get this feeling that it's all been worthwhile. And of course, many, many people meet that entirely outside work. Uh, maybe from uh, uh, family, raising a family, etc., and so on. But if work can provide for some of these needs, then it will motivate you. So, uh, for example, uh, work provides you with uh, medical care or medical insurance. Work provides you with a pension. Work provides you maybe with uh, safe working conditions. All of these are going to be motivating you. Uh, social, uh, if uh, work, uh, you have maybe a, a staff canteen, if work, uh, if your employer, uh, uh, you know, tries hard to have maybe social evenings and meetings and so on, where socialization takes place, you, you become friendly with people at your job, then that's, that's quite good. Uh, promotion at work uh, will feed your esteem needs. Just your boss telling you well done, a pat on the back, uh, it will help your esteem needs as well, and so on. Uh, and if maybe you feel you are learning, if your skills are increasing, uh, and so on, uh, if you're becoming an expert in something, uh, then, then it, at work you can even get up to the self-actualization stage. Now, uh, you have to be a little bit careful uh, about Maslow here, uh, 
uh, he did uh, derive this hierarchy of needs from uh, observing the behavior of uh, monkeys at the Bronx Zoo. Uh, so to what extent it can then move from monkeys to people? And then, of course, he was based in America. Uh, and uh, I'm not making a, a trivial point here. Uh, different countries uh, maybe are motivated, or the citizens of different countries are maybe motivated by different things. So we could argue that, that uh, maybe in the uh, certain countries that uh, people are very uh, motivated by money. Uh, in some countries, uh, people are not so much interested in money, but they're very interested in socializing. Very, uh, that's, that's say, the nature of that country and so on. In some countries, uh, esteem is very important, uh, that, that, that people uh, look up to you uh, is it, seen to be a very, very valuable um, need which has to be met. So not every person and, and not every country's characteristics are going to be the same. Uh, not every person is necessarily going to go up to these in, in particular order. Uh, we have to recognize that at different stages of a person's life, uh, they may have different priorities in these needs. So if you take a, a young family, uh, the young family, the, what will motivate the, 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 uh, the, the parents, if you like, or the, whichever parent is working in that young family, is very much physiological and safety. They, they want uh, enough money to bring up the family. It, it's a financially quite difficult time. Uh, they want job security and so on. Uh, there, that's what they're really going to be interested in. You could have it maybe when somebody's getting up towards retirement, uh, they don't need the money as much. They, they've kind of bought their house, the family's gone and so on. Uh, but they might be saying, well, you know, I'm uh, 65, time is running out. Uh, uh, I, I'm not interested in any more promotion. I'd be perhaps more interested in uh, social needs. So rather than working overtime to earn money, I would rather have time off uh, that I can spend with my friends and family and so on. So not everyone goes up this in the, uh, uh, the same order. We have uh, some of these listed here. Uh, uh, our behavior responds to different needs. Uh, managers have to try to spot what will turn somebody on. We're all uh, individuals. It doesn't necessarily deal with altruistic uh, behavior. Altruistic behavior is uh, basically a kind of charitable uh, behavior uh, here. The hierarchy of needs uh, doesn't necessarily explain uh, why one person might help another one at work. Okay. Uh, maybe it's social which does that. Uh, maybe it isn't. Uh, and it was very much based on Western, particularly United States, maybe cultural values, uh, where maybe money is uh, quite important, uh, maybe esteem is quite important, maybe the title which goes with your job uh, is, is quite important uh, as, as well. So, next theory, Hertzberg, and Hertzberg is known uh, for a two-factor uh, theory. Uh, he talked about hygiene factors and he talked about motivating factors, a two-factor theory. Now, uh, hygiene, an odd word maybe to be bringing into management theory. Why this word hygiene really means clean or sterile? We talk about we want hospitals to be hygienic. We want restaurants to be hygienic. Uh, what's this about a job being hygienic? Does it mean good cleaning? No, it doesn't. Well, not, not, not exclusively. What he was saying was that if you're ill and you go to a hospital, uh, before the hospital can even start making you well, it has to be hygienic. And if it's not hygienic, it will do damage. Uh, but hygiene does not of itself make you well. Hygiene is a starting point. Uh, so what he was saying in a job is that before you can start turning people on, uh, you have to get certain elements within the job right. 
The absence of these elements would cause job dissatisfaction. And the elements uh, which uh, he was talking about, at least some of them in here, the, these job dissatisfiers, if you like, uh, one was uh, pay. You must feel uh, that you are being paid a fair wage for the work you're doing. You must feel uh, that uh, you are uh, paid in, in the right sort of scale compared to your colleagues. It would be a very high dissatisfaction factor uh, if you and a colleague were doing exactly the same work, uh, exactly the same experience, but for some reason the colleague was paid 20% more. Or you felt that the pay was so low that you were kind of worried about eating almost, uh, or you felt you were being exploited. This uh, will become obsessive. Uh, and this uh, obsessive feeling of unfairness, of exploitation, would simply get in the way uh, of any sort of motivation. Uh, second, you can have the, the conditions. The physical conditions at work. Uh, it, it, uh, if, if it's too noisy, too dusty, too hot, too cold, and so on, and too, too dangerous perhaps, uh, again, this will become obsessive uh, and uh, any kind of motivation which people put on it are on top of these unsatisfactory conditions is probably going to be ineffective. There is uh, your relations at work. Uh, we're talking here about the uh, uh, relations with your uh, colleagues, relations with your boss. And, uh, and so on. Uh, so if you are almost in a state of constant war with your colleagues, they don't get on with you, you don't get on with them and so on, you're just going to hate going to work. You will dread getting up to go to work. Similarly, if you're in a state of war with your boss, the boss always seems to be picking on you, you believe it's unfair in, in some way. Again, this will just obsess you uh, and it will be impossible uh, to get any um, uh, motivating factors to work. So you have to get certain things right. Reasonable pay, reasonable conditions. You have to feel you're getting on pretty well that with your colleagues. It's not too uncomfortable uh, a process getting uh, going, going to work. And then on top of that, once you've got this right, you can put on the motivating factors. And the uh, sort of uh, uh, qualities which Herzberg said were motivating factors are, are, are things like the following. Uh, there is challenge. You're given a job which is slightly challenging uh, and we feel kind of inspired to do well. It's interesting to be given a challenging job. It's not particularly motivating to be given the same old job time after time after time. Uh, but if your manager can kind of sprinkle in from here and here, inject uh, a little bit of a challenge from time to time to, to give you some interest, then that's pretty good. There is recognition. There is responsibility. So your manager gives you responsibility uh, to maybe achieve quite a challenging budget. And then once you've achieved that, the manager says, well done. Uh, these are the, the, the things which really kind of turn, turn people on. And, and people work hard at trying to do this. Uh, there are some organizations uh, where they have a kind of monthly competition for employee of the month or salesperson of the month and so on there, which is giving recognition. If you like, it's feeding into Maslow's esteem needs uh, and so on. Be given challenge and responsibilities, maybe helping your self actualization needs, uh, and, uh, and so on. And, and the final thing, which people sometimes talk about, is a feeling of growth. That you as a person are growing, you're, you're gaining more skills, more experience, and so on. Uh, you're improving as a person. And of course, if you are getting more skills and more experience, this is adding towards, I suppose, meeting some of your safety needs and so on on the. the uh, the Maslow theory. There is an element uh, here of uh, parallel, I think, with 
Maslow, these uh, hygiene factors of reasonable conditions, uh, reasonable pay, and so on, uh, there's a certain lining up there with maybe the physiological needs and the safety needs in Maslow. This uh, stuff here, uh, recognition, challenge, uh, responsibility, and so on, is maybe getting up towards esteem needs, self-actualization self needs, uh, and, and so on. So Hertzberg, two-factor theory, Hertzberg and hygiene. Both Maslow and Hertzberg were content theories. They were saying, basically, what's, what's in the job that will motivate you? We come on now to Vroom and the expectancy theory. This is a process theory of motivation. Uh, this uh, tries to uh, work out uh, the mental process you go through to become motivated. And he expresses it in a form of an equation like this, uh, where force, the force we have here, this is the motivating force. How strong are you going to be motivated? And uh, Vroom says you go through a, a, a kind of a mental process, mental calculation, uh, to decide how turned on you're going to be uh, here. And he talked about the valence and expectancy. And valence is uh, how much you want the outcome. So how much, how badly you want the outcome. So how badly you want the outcome. So if you offer somebody a performance-related bonus, and the performance-related bonus is $25,000, uh, then probably most people will be very keen to get that $25,000. It's a real turn-on. Uh, uh, really uh, anxious to get that. If, however, you offered uh, somebody maybe a $5 bonus uh, after a year's work, if they achieve their uh, budget, uh, I would suggest that maybe you're not going to be greatly inspired by the promise of a $5 bonus. As well as what you're offering to people and, and how much they, they wanted, they will be doing a little, little kind of calculation of how likely am I to get that. This is the expectancy. So the probability of getting the, the, the reward. The probability of achievement. The probability that you will get the bonus. So I could, uh, for example, let's say people were doing an exam, not F1, but uh, let's say one of the, the more advanced uh, exams. Uh, and I could say to somebody, I will pay you $10,000 uh, if you get 99% or above in this exam. So, valence is very strong, uh, $10,000, and of course they get a pass, so, so they really want to get the exam. Uh, but you think, how likely am I to get 99% of one of the advanced ACCA exams, which is kind of not multiple choice and so on, uh, and most people would, would conclude that they have no chance whatsoever of getting 99% in, in, in most of those exams, uh, and therefore that's not going to motivate. How motivated would somebody be if I said, all right, I will give you $5 uh, if you get 60% in an exam? And of course, getting 60% in an exam is something which is very achievable. Uh, but really, the, the $5 is not going to make much difference to, to how hard you try. It's, it's not worth it. So high expectation but low valence. What you need is something that people want. And you must give them a reasonable expectation that if they work hard, uh, they will get it. Uh, so when you're, you are setting performance-related pay and bonuses and so on, it, it must be worth something getting out, but you mustn't set the hurdle so high that it will give up before they start. Uh, it doesn't have to be money which you're giving people. Uh, it could be promotion. So somebody could say to themselves, right, uh, I would like to be promoted to a manager. 
And they'd be doing a little little thought process in their head and saying, right, who, who else might be in contention for this? And they see that their colleague is the owner's daughter, for example. And they say to themselves, it doesn't matter how hard I work, probably the person who's actually going to get this promotion is the owner's daughter. Uh, but if, if you say, well, I'd like to be manager, what's the chance of me getting it? And you look around your colleagues uh, and you see, you see nobody else who's really in contention. You'd think to yourself, right, there's quite a good chance that the promotion will come my way. I will be motivated to work quite hard uh, and, and to quite impress people. Uh, in the hope that I win the promotion. So the, the prospect or the opportunity of promotion uh, can be motivating. So that is Froome's expectancy uh, theory. Next we have uh, theory X and uh, theory Y, or uh, McGregor uh, here. And this is, uh, it, 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 I always think it's actually uh, almost a simplification of the Ashridge uh, tells cells um, cells joins with here. McGregor uh, looked at managers uh, and how managers manage really because uh, McGregor was saying that a, a strong influence and motivation is how your manager treats you. And McGregor came out with two sorts of managers here. He had what he called the Theory X manager. And the Theory X manager assumes that people do not like work. Okay. So assumes a dislike of work. Assumes that your staff dislike work. Uh, you assume really they only come to work out of desperation because they need to have money to live on, but there's no other pleasure in it. Uh, you assume that, that people will uh, not work as hard as they should, uh, that they will try to skimp work, they will try to avoid work and, to, and so on there. Uh, you might even assume that your workforce will cheat. Now, if you are, have got this kind of uh, assumption about your workforce, then you're going to watch these people really, really carefully. So this Theory X manager is going to be extremely autocratic. You'll certainly not be asking your workforce uh, for any suggestions because you'll be assuming that the only thing the workforce will suggest is how they can have an easy time. So you'll just tell them to do this and you'll watch them really, really carefully. You will, you will pick them up as soon as they uh, depart from what they should be doing and so on, there is absolutely kind of no leeway. You rule with a rod of iron. Uh, the theory why manager, very different outlook on your, on your workers uh, here. Uh, the theory why manager, there's a great saying here, assumes really uh, that these people think work is, uh, work is as in, in a way as much fun as play. So work is, is as enjoyable as play. So you say uh, effectively here uh, that people come to work willingly, uh, that, that work is as natural or as enjoyable as play, uh, that it is a natural state for people to, to want to be occupied, to want to be achieving something, uh, to feel that they're being productive and, uh, uh, and so on. And people are enthusiastic about work. These people will come into work and they will want to work, they will want to do good, they want to do good for their employer and so on here. Uh, and here in your theory why, you're going to have be a really very participative manager. You're going to be a much more trusting manager. Here you will ask people for their opinion, but because these people want to do well, they will come up with, with, with good ideas uh, about how to do better. Uh, you will not watch them as carefully. You will assume they will work 
hard and so on because they are motivated by achieving the outputs and so on. They, they want to do good, basically. Now, we would probably want to be uh, managed by a kind of theory-wide manager. But McGregor didn't call this kind of theory good and theory bad or theory right and theory wrong. Uh, McGregor called them X and Y to be neutral. Uh, because McGregor recognized that there are some people who do dislike work, uh, that the job is maybe a rotten kind of a job, and the only reason anyone would think of doing it is because they need money to live on, really. And people, some people do go to work very reluctantly. Any of us in that job might go to work fairly reluctantly. Uh, and probably your manager will get the best out of these people by being fairly autocratic. If, if, uh, and these people expect to be told what to do. Uh, there's an element of background as well of people, what, pe what people expect. These are probably relatively low-skilled jobs. Uh, people have been used all their lives to be kind of told what to do and so on. And if the Theory X manager tries to be participative and asks people, their opinion, their employees actually get suspicious. They think, well, why are you asking me uh, my opinion? This is a trap, and so on. Uh, if you, however, try your theory X management on what people who are highly skilled, uh, who've been taught to think for themselves, who expect to, to be consulted, and so on, and you come in trying to lay down the law, then that's not going to motivate them. That's going to be a huge, big turnoff. So, so it, there's an element of contingency theory in here. What, made, what motivates people is not a single thing. Uh, even back to Maslow, uh, we would uh, say uh, that different people at different stages of their lives can be motivated by different promises, different offerings. And managers have to be sensitive to, to what this particular employee might particularly want and therefore be motivated by. Similarly here, we're not saying theory X is always wrong, theory Y is always right. It, it, it maybe depends on what people are doing. It depends on their background, what their expectations are, and so on. Here you motivate by participation. Here you get the best out of people, maybe, by being very autocratic and simply telling them what to do. Uh, finish with a, a couple of... Uh, uh, almost finish this with a couple of... Uh, definitions you must know, intrinsic rewards and extrinsic rewards uh, here. Intrinsic rewards are something which are internal to you. You generate your own kind of internal uh, reward. So, for example, a feeling of achievement. You've been given a challenge, you get it done, even if nobody says anything, you feel good. That's an intrinsic reward. Uh, you have learned uh, a couple of new commands on Excel. Uh, that's a reward. Uh, because you know, there's an element of personal advancement and learning and, 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 and so on within that. That's intrinsic. An extrinsic uh, reward comes from outside. Uh, and typically it's pay, it could be bonuses, it could be praise because this is coming from your manager and so on. Uh, it could be being uh, awarded salesperson of the week, uh, sort of award and, uh, and so on. Uh, and enjoying the esteem of your colleagues, but essentially it's coming uh, from outside the organization. Uh, finally, in this uh, section, uh, we have uh, pay as a motivator. Uh, to what extent does higher wages motivate people? And uh, what we have to think about uh, within this is a number of factors. First of all, uh, we have to think uh, about how pay is actually determined. Uh, and there are some, sometimes difficulties in, in this. Sometimes pay, you, you're simply going to pay the going rate. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, what you can give to people is constrained by pay bands. If you're a particular grade of a person, uh, the, the, the people can only be paid within that, within that band. So maybe no matter how good somebody is, uh, you can't actually use pay to motivate them or very greatly increased pay uh, to motivate them. 
Uh, second, uh, we have to think, uh, you know, what can, we, what can we afford people, what can we afford to give people here? If a company is going through hard times, uh, then it may simply be impossible to increase the pay or to link it with bonuses and uh, so on. Uh, we have to uh, think uh, maybe what people want from pay, what the, um, the, uh, a decent level of pay is for their skills and so on there. Uh, we need to think of performance related pay, how are we going to make that work in practice. Uh, so you could have uh, performance related pay which is maybe geared to company profits. Uh, but there is a bit of a disconnect between what many people do at work, perhaps they work really, really hard, but for some reason the company's made poor, poor profits that year. So you've got somebody who's worked really hard, put their heart and soul into it, uh, maybe because of the economy, the company has done poorly, uh, and so we don't have any kind of profit-related pay going to that person. That doesn't work quite so well. Uh, another example of difficulties in performance-related pay is uh, how do we know what this single person is responsible for? Uh, so even if you take a, a salesperson, give them a commission based on sales, and this is uh, sometimes one of the most uh, kind of cut and dried ways of trying to get performance related pay, you get a 5% commission on sales. Um, if the production people don't produce, then you can't sell. If the research and development people don't produce new and attractive products, they're not going to sell. And so again, the, the, you have what's called interdependencies going on within it. And then uh, finally, we have to think, do we want to in, uh, incentivize or motivate an individual or do we want to incentivize and motivate a group? Uh, because very often it is the group which is responsible for good achievement rather than any particular individual in a group. So we could say to a sales team, you will get a bonus if you hit a, a certain target and so on. Again, we have to think how we're going to measure it. Uh, we have to be, I think, aware that within that group, uh, the, the group members may recognize someone who isn't pulling their weight. Uh, and, and they get irritated. I'm, I'm, I'm in the group. I'm working very, very hard. This person's in the same group, but I don't think they're, they're working nearly as hard. Yet we're all going to get the same kind of group bonus and so on there. Linking performance-related pay, bonuses, rewards uh, to individual effort is actually very difficult. Uh, when Hertzberg originally uh, wrote his hygiene theory and motivation, uh, he had pay on the hygiene side, decent pay. Uh, but then when he had his uh, second uh, go at the theory, really, he had pay on both sides. First of all, you need enough pay uh, to get rid of any job satisfaction, to get rid of any job dissatisfaction. You must feel you have enough pay to live on that you'll be fairly rewarded for what you're doing. And then in the second theory, he said, yes, but maybe if we give some sort of performance-related pay, this will motivate people, this will really kind of turn them on to strive harder uh, to make those extra sales.